This is a production of Cornell University. All right, thank you, Don. It's, uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. And as Don said, I was an undergraduate here and at the opposite end of this hallway work mounting herbarium specimens uh, back uh, in my senior year. It's one of my uh, jobs, one of the better jobs I had here as an undergrad. Uh, so it's, it's really nice to be back in this building and, and relive memories um, of this building. So I have a lot to cover today, uh, probably more than I, I can cover, but we'll see how far we get today. So um, what I primarily want to talk about is, um, so um, uh, what I want to talk about is the role of botanic gardens that you may not think of in terms of um, plant exploration and plant introduction. And so, and give you a, the briefest of histories of the Morris Arboretum, but then get into some of the work that I've done. Uh, I'm really focusing on China. We do some collecting in the United States as well, and I'll, if I have time, we'll finish with that, but mainly focus on China because it's, it's exotic and there are good stories about uh, traveling in China. So, um, sorry about that. that, that's all right. Um, the Morris Arboretum was, a, uh, was formerly an estate. Uh, John and Lydia Morris, who were siblings, uh, moved there in 1887, set up their family estate or their country home there, and it's shown on the left of this slide. As you can see, it was very open at the time. This was sort of out in the country, and this really was a self-sustaining country estate. Um, they were very interested in all sorts of things. They were interested in uh, antiques, plants, uh, artwork, and they collected plants as well as uh, lots of other things. And this shows uh, the Rose Garden and the conservatories back in the early 1930s. Um, so since then, the Arboretum has evolved. Uh, we are still a collection, and we really think of ourselves as a collections-based botanic garden. But uh, we embellish the garden, embellish the collections with um, ornamentals. So we're well known for our rose garden is one of the things. Uh, our historic collection of trees, and, and Philadelphia has a pretty ideal climate. It's sort of a sweet spot in terms of growing trees. And so some of the things like this, our big Katsura are the biggest of their kind, and certainly in, in Eastern North America. Uh, as Don said, we have a, a great witch hazel collection, one of my interests. Um, magnolias is something we've had a long standing interest in, uh, and then maples uh, as well. And so all of these are, are some of the primary focuses, but we have other things we, we grow as well. So I'll give you a 30 second uh, you know, plant exploration history. And, and a, a lot of people think of the golden age of plant exploration as the early 1900s, when people like E.H. Wilson uh, were collecting for first for beach nurseries in England and then for the Arnold Arboretum in Boston. Um, and Wilson uh, is famous for lots of things, including the dove tree, uh, Davidia and Valucrata. Uh, but Wilson also had a strong horticultural interest. Um, and later in his, after he broke his leg in China, he was, he traveled to Japan which even then was, you know, travel was a little easier in Japan, uh, collected a lot of azaleas. So a lot of the Kurumi azaleas, the first introductions were through Wilson. Uh, and he was also interested in flowering cherries, which is something that uh, I think is long forgotten about E.H. Wilson. And, and one of my great interests are flowering cherries as well. And so, uh, so that's the early 1900s. Through uh, World War II, China was still open to Westerners, so uh, things like metasequoia uh, were able to come out of China, as it were. Uh, this is our big metasequoia grove at the Morris Arboretum. I should say we're four hours pretty much due south of here, so it's not that hard um, to get to Philadelphia, but it's a, probably a full zone warmer, so it feels like Nina always brings her class down in April, and they feel like they've arrived in the tropics when they come down there. So. Uh, please come down and visit us. Um, so, um, you know, why do we go uh, plant exploring? Here's, you know, some of the reasons, and I won't read through these, but I'll try and touch on uh, not all of these, but many of these today in my talk. Um, so back in the late 70s, the Arboretum uh, identified regions around the world that we would target for plant exploration. And some of these seem obvious, the Eastern United States, uh, Central China, going up into Manchuria or northeastern China, the Korean Peninsula, northern Japan. But what might be uh, less obvious are the Balkans and Asia Minor, areas that have similar climates to Philadelphia and that yield you know, plants of good ornamental interest for us. Um, so uh, those were our goals in the late 70s. Here's uh, where we've gone uh, since then in terms of plant exploration trips. And it's better seen graphically on this slide. And you can see 
in purple are the target areas, and then the pins represent where we've gone uh, since then. Uh, so we've really, you know, over the last, it's almost 30 years now, really set some goals and, and been able to systematically achieve those goals. So I like to start out this talk with talking about invasiveness, because when I first started giving this talk, that was always the first question that people ask. Like, do you want to bring back invasives? And of course, the answer is no. So I start with this and hopefully we'll you know, dispel uh, that question. So perhaps the, the sort of the greatest uh, example or a great example of uh, invasives that were planted with all, you know, with great ideas and great intentions is calorie pear or Pyrus caloriana. Um, planted and promoted widely in the, uh, you know, in, starting in the 1960s, this is one of the original plantings of Bradford Pear. Uh, this is the original planting of Bradford Pear in College Park, Maryland from uh, the 1960s. Uh, you know, great, great tree, look re looks really good. Um, here they are today and they've really done well. They were pruned well uh, at the beginning and they've held up really well other than the, the power lines on the left. Um, and, uh, but we all know the problems with calorie pear. One is the you know, weak crotches and them splitting. But I think more important from an ecological point of view is the invasiveness. And what's happened is originally there was basically one clone planted, which is self infertile. Subsequently, additional clones were planted. So there's outcrossing and fruit production. Um, so we have one of these, unfortunately, in front of our house, my, it's actually my neighbor's tree. And those little fruits, not only are they annoying, but they stain the paint on your car, which is uh, doubly annoying. Uh, so if you were to drive uh, I-95 from Philadelphia to Washington, when the Yoshino cherries were in flower, this is what you would see. And these are not Yoshino cherries, these are calorie pears. And basically, once you hit Baltimore, and from Baltimore to probably at least Richmond, this is what I-95 looks like the first third of um, uh, April. And certainly we don't want to recreate this. We want to avoid this wherever we can. So as plant explorers, as botanic gardens, I think one of our roles is to evaluate uh, invasives. And so I don't shy away from it. I think that's something we need to embrace and think about and take on in the, uh, as a role of botanic gardens. So a little more exciting than that is looking at hardiness uh, and vigor. So you, know, you may think of Philadelphia as being the banana belt, but we really cannot grow camellias that reliably in Philadelphia. Uh, there were some cold winters in the early 80s that wiped out you know, most of the collections of camellias in, in Philadelphia and certainly in Washington, D.C. And from that uh, arose a program at the National Arboretum mainly to do uh, camellia breeding for hardiness. And, and you think of the camellia belt basically as uh, Norfolk, Virginia going down the coast on uh, the Gulf Coast and then California up into the Pacific Northwest. So we're above what might be called the Camellia Belt. Well, with this in mind, in the mid 80s, uh, our director and some colleagues from the National Arboretum and Longwood Gardens went to a couple islands off the coast of Korea. Uh, these islands are above the 38th parallel, so it was politically sensitive to go there. Uh, and it's the northernmost uh, populations of Camellia japonica or the common Camellia. And here are uh, Camellia japonicas growing on those islands. Uh, you can see, you may be able to see on the lower left, there's a person standing there. So these get to be small trees. Um, and uh, they collected a large number of seed from three islands there. Uh, these are single uh, red flowered camellias, not the highly ornamental camellias. But the, the purpose of this was to look for uh, extending hardiness in zone six. So, we planted out about 750 of these starting in the late 80s. Uh, after uh, a couple of winters, this is what they looked like. Uh, and then from those, we culled those and they're down to about 50 plants from those original uh, 750. Um, those are now planted throughout the Arboretum. We subsequently did evaluations of those and made four selections from our plants, um, one of which is here on campus in the ILR, ILR quad. So there is, uh, you know, there was shown to be extra hardiness in these. And so this is, if you think about it, the selections were made around 2010, plants were collected in, in 84. So this is a generation of work. And one of the beauties of uh, where I work and I think of botanic arts in general is you do have that long-term horizon. You're able to do projects that take a whole generation to uh, undertake. So as I said, uh, nice glossy leaves, single red flowers. Uh, and here are, um, not just our selections, ours are the bottom four, uh, Balustrade, Bloomfield, 
Meadowbrook and Morris Mercury and others that came out of uh, Longwood Gardens and then a, another Korean fire from a, a private individual. So again, this was a really targeted collection that did result in uh, improved hardiness and these are now commercially available. And so you, could, you, know, you can buy these from a few mail order nurseries. So starting in the uh, early 90s, our shift, uh, our focus shifted to uh, collecting in China, as you can see here. Uh, so the 80s, really, there was focus on Korea. Politically, things got easier, and so uh, China opened up, and we've really gone on a large number of trips uh, to China since then. We haven't done this alone. We partner, as Don said, a partnership called NACPEC, uh, and it's been a, a really great, we call it a consortium because there's no bylaws, there's no... Uh, administration. Uh, it's just a group of gardens that are committed to, to this that have been working together for uh, 25 years uh, to collect and work with partners in China. So it's been a really great effort. Um, so if you think about China and the United States, uh, they are about the same land mass, roughly. Large parts of China are, have very similar climates to the United States. So there are a lot of areas that are easy uh, targets in terms of finding climatic analogs that work in whether it's southeastern Pennsylvania or uh, Boston or Chicago. So what we've really targeted are uh, a set of mountains in central China, the Qinling Mountains, which is the continental divide between uh, the Yangtze River uh, to the north and the Yellow River uh, to the south. Um, and sorry, other way around, Yellow River to the north, Yangtze River to the south. Um, and collecting around the city of Xi'an, which is the, uh, term, one of the terminus of the Silk Road, a very, the ancient capital of China, and where the, you may know it for the terracotta soldiers. Uh, and so that area uh, has very similar climate and great plant diversity. So we've really, as you can see, targeted uh, the Qinling Mountains, both you know, from, from east to west. Uh, so what's it mean to go to China? We have partners. Uh, and often we'll, we'll land in Beijing and spend a couple of days just getting acclimated. It's a uh, 12 or 14 hour flight from Chicago to Beijing. So you need a little time to recover from jet lag, do a little sightseeing uh, in some of, the, you know, some of the historic sites in Beijing, do a little uh, horticulture um, browsing and, or, or looking at some of the places. This is Pinus Bungiana at one of the uh, royal palaces in Beijing. Uh, and then, you know, go to the Great Wall, you're know, sort of the, the touristy things. Uh, in recent years, we've transited to Xi'an because it's closer to where we're going. Xi'an is a fascinating place. It's really a melting pot of cultures. Um, it's a strong Muslim influence there. And so it's a very uh, culturally interesting place uh, in China. Uh, and it's one of the two cities with, a, with the remaining wall in China. The, most cities in China have walls, city walls. They were torn down during the Cultural Revolution, but um, the one in Xi'an was maintained. So it's an interesting juxtaposition between the modern and the ancient uh, when you visit a place like this. Um, so from there, we then head out and uh, start to do our collecting in, in targeted areas. And as I said, we, um, oh, it, last year I was uh, there in southern Sichuan and visited, kind of again at the beginning of the trip, visited a place that um, it's basically the yellow zone of uh, China, Huanglong uh, Nature Preserve, which has these very interesting uh, travertine pools, a really remarkable place um, to visit. I traveled the last several years with another Cornell grad, Michael Dosman. Um, Michael and I have these sort of strangely parallel lives um, that have intersected at, at many points. Um, and so we've been great friends uh, since the mid 90s uh, and have traveled in China and are still friends. Uh, so uh, it's a testament to something. Um, and so uh, this was, again, this was last year, which I'll, I'll get back to in a minute, but a, a wonderful place. And it's nice to have at least a day or so to acclimate and just do a little tourism before you uh, get out into the field and doing your collecting. Um, so um, as I said, partnerships are really key. For the last 10 years or so, we've worked with the Beijing Botanic Garden. On the right is Kong Wang, uh, who works at the Beijing Botanic Garden, has really been our entree into China and really has sort of makes it all happen when we're there. Um, but we also then partner with local botanists. In 2005, we worked with uh, Professor Sun uh, from the Lanzhou Botanic Garden in Gansu, province of Gansu. Um, this past year, we worked with the Hong, folks at the Huanglong um, Research Station. So it's always good to have uh, a local botanist. This is the uh, someone from Chengdu Institute of Botany in Sichuan, who was with us last year. Um, 
So we'll start out sort of, uh, we'll, we'll set up base and try and stay there for three or four days and then radiate out from there so we're not traveling too much. Um, and sometimes you drive through countryside that looks like this. Um, and you know, there doesn't seem to be a, a natural plant as far as the eye can see. And you sort of wonder, well, where, where's something that you know, we're targeted in terms of collecting? And it's, I mean, this slide is a couple years old, but you still see this, just this terrace agriculture uh, is pretty remarkable. Uh, and you really can't get any machines up there. So in some ways, it's like traveling back in time when you visit these very rural places. Um, eventually, you hit the end of the road uh, and then start hiking up and doing uh, your collecting. So, um, and you know, we tried and find these forest cuts where the seed is actually lower on the plants, where we might be able to reach the seed on the plants. Um, so uh, one of the things, as I said, that we've been trying to do is looking at uh, species conservation and using botanic gardens as a model for species conservation. Uh, one, in terms of capturing enough diversity that you can actually do some conservation in the garden, but then also uh, using, collecting unusual and rare species as demonstrations and as educational opportunities. So we've been focusing on uh, maples uh, as one of our groups, and we're part of the um, APGA's Plant Collections Network along with Cornell Botanic Gardens. We're one of the multi-site holders of, um, uh, of maples. So the last few years, uh, this has been one of my great interests in building our collection. Um, we've collected things that look, you know, you think of as maples. This is Acer Singling Ants. Looks a lot like a sugar maple. And then things that don't really look uh, very maple-like. That yellow shrubby plant in the mid-ground is Acer stachyophyllum, which is uh, a high elevation Chinese species. Doesn't look very maple-like. Um, it's actually related to Acer spicatum, if you know that native species. Um, another one is Acer pectinatum. Again, uh, you know, looks somewhat maple-like, but kind of stretches what you think of uh, as uh, a typical maple. I mean, certainly the Samaras uh, give it off here. Um, and then a recent collection is something that hadn't been in the United States, Acer tricaudatum, which is related to Acer platinoides, a um, plant that wasn't in cultivation in the U.S. And really, I think it's, it's best used as a teaching tool to talk about plant diversity. Um, a very interesting and beautiful plant. Um, and then something, you know, sometimes you come across things that are familiar, um, but uh, perhaps in their native setting don't seem that familiar. So this is a plant that I've seen all over, not all over, but seen relatively commonly here on campus. Anyone know what this is? Dan? <laughs> no? So this is Acer grisium growing in the wild, uh, which you may not think of, um, but you know, there it is, um, growing out of, basically out of a rock face here. Um, pretty remarkable. Um, so about 2010, this publication came out, The Red List of Maples, and what's on the cover? Acer grisium. So this was an epiphany for me. Uh, I realized at this point that Acer grisium is uh, an endangered species in China. It's a, I wouldn't say common, but it's a well-loved garden plant. Uh, it's, it's really a wonderful garden plant, but in its native habitat, it's endangered mostly through habitat fragmentation uh, and you know, reproduction, reproductive barriers. So we started a project um, to look at how much genetic diversity is in cultivation and whether or not that captures the genetic diversity of plants in the wild or whether further conservation efforts need to be made. So essentially, how many pandas, how many Acer grisiums do you need in captivity to capture the genetic diversity of the wild if the, if the pandas or the Acer grisium were to go extinct? So here's the native range of paperbark maple. Um, and this is, if you don't know this plant, it's a wonderful garden plant. It has this great exfoliating bark fabulous fall collar, and a plant of many, many interests throughout the year. Really, you know, one of my favorite garden plants. The uh, known collections in the United States only come from a, a relatively restricted part of the range. So this kind of in reinforced our hypothesis that perhaps what's in cultivation is just a fragment or, or a segment of the greater diversity. So what we decided to do starting in 2013 was to sample known wild collected plants in the United States at these locations. Uh, and then uh, folks at the Morton Arboretum start, were doing the molecular analysis of these. And so if there's any molecular biologists in here, I'm going to have to pass on the questions, but I, I sort of know the general concept. Um, so we collected in the United States and then um, in 2014 went to England and collected from old 
known wild collected trees throughout England, Scotland, and uh, Wales. And then uh, here's the national champion, Ace Grisium in Wales with my friend, uh, Chris Bachtel from the Morton Arboretum in Chicago. And then in 2015, um, Chris Bachtel, Michael Kong, and I uh, went to China to collect across the range of Ace Grisium in China and taking leaf samples. So we traveled within a 500 mile radius of Xi'an. And just to give you some perspective, we traveled about 1,600 miles in two weeks, uh, which a 500 mile radius of Philadelphia or Denver gives you some idea of the area in which we, we traveled. And so the topography was probably more like Denver uh, than it was like Philadelphia. Um, and so as I said, here were the known collections uh, previously in the United States. We were taking leaf samples and wherever we could um, seed, there was only two places we saw seed. And so we, you know, we tried to cover as much of the uh, known uh, range as possible. So comparing the two, we really expanded the, the range of collections. Um, and just to give you another uh, example of where we collected. Um, so again, we, we, I think we feel that we've well sampled the, the range. Uh, there was one population that we couldn't find, but we, we feel like we have a pretty good handle on it. Um, so probably the most impressive tree we saw was one that a colleague had seen in 1995. Uh, this is a tree growing outside of a village in uh, southern Shanxi province. Uh, and colleagues of ours had seen this, had made notes, and had GPS readings of where this was. So we were able to go back and look at their notes uh, and go right back to that place. So it really speaks to this idea of keeping good records. And one of the things about collecting in the field and being a botanic garden is keeping good records. Uh, so, you know, this is a great testimony that we were able to go right back to that spot. Um, so. The Morton Arboretum doing this work has been able to construct this molecular tree. Uh, so the main thing I want to point out is the blue center where it says Hubei, Wilson 1901. These are all the plants in cultivation from the United States and from England. So basically everything that we've sampled in cultivation came from a collection that E.H. Wilson made in 1901. So that's what we call a genetic bottleneck. Basically everything in cultivation is one seed collection. Supposedly 100 trees germinated then, but um, that's it. And you can see in comparison, the other populations that we've sampled, the northern populations in China are on the top, and then the more southerly populations are on the bottom. So from this data, it looks like what we're not well capturing uh, what's in cultivation right now. There's, a, there's one missing piece of this. Uh, there's a, a major nursery on the west coast in Oregon, Heritage Seedlings, that grows something to the tune of 40,000 Acer Grisium a year and sells, not just grows, but sells. Um, and we've sampled those and they're not included in these. So the, the last question is, do they have anything else that's not shown on this slide? And so once those data are back, we'll have the full picture and we'll know which populations we need to target for preservation in China. So the next steps are to work with our Chinese colleagues to do in C2 and XC2 conservation of, of some of those more uh, threatened populations in China. So that's, you know, this project's been a really exciting one. It's taken about four years now, and it's been a really uh, gratifying project. It's literally taken me around the world and, and really been a, a fun and interesting project. So um, moving on, uh, talking a little bit about insect and disease resistance. So um, I, you, Living in Ithaca, certainly you know Canada hemlock, which is you know sort of a wonderful um, forest species. Uh, this is the the most recent map I could find of the spread of hemlock woolly adelgid, and it does seem to be creeping up into this part of central New York. It's been a problem in Philadelphia for 25 or more years, uh, and and it basically uh, saps the strength of the uh, hemlocks to the point where they're they're very thin and weak, and eventually succumb to this, or they they can sort of you know, limp along with hemlock woolly adelgid, but they really, from a ecological point of view and from an ornamental view, they really lose their value uh, in the, either in the wild or in the landscape. Chinese hemlock uh, is, appears to be resistant to hemlock woolly adelgid. The, the adelgid that is uh, the invasive one is uh, a Japanese insect. Up until uh, the mid 90s, there was, had been two collections of Chinese hemlock and really two trees in the United States. So again, a real genetic bottleneck. So if we wanted to look at increasing the diversity for hybridization work and for evaluation work, we targeted Chinese hemlock and have made a number of collections in uh, central China since the mid 90s. Here's 
Chris Bachtel with the collection in 2005. Um, and one of the things we do, as I said, when we're doing these collections, we make, we, I'm still living in the pen and pencil, paper, or the pencil and paper world, uh, takes you know, scrupulous notes uh, so that you know, people in 20 or 50 years know where we were. Um, we take herbarium specimens, which are deposited in, in various herbaria. Um, and uh, we spend our time, you know, in the nights and evenings cleaning seed and getting ready to package the seed and, and bring it back to the United States. So we generally collect seed because if you think about it, you know, 100 acorns have a great, you know, deal of diversity and they're really transportable. If you try and bring back 100 uh, oak seedlings, it's, it's very, very challenging. So, you know, seed basically is prepackaged to travel. That's the whole point of seed is dispersal. So uh, it makes our lives a lot easier. And so we are very, um, meticulous about uh, cleaning and, and uh, packaging our seed and making sure we get it in appropriately and, and with all you know, the appropriate permits. Um, so here we are packing up at the end of one trip. And then the really exciting part is when you see them germinate in your greenhouse. These are um, Suga chinensis that we collected in 2005 uh, and then growing on in your greenhouse and then eventually planted in the landscape. So that's you know, the fulfilling part um, with some of these collections. So we're actually at the stage with the Chinese hemlock where we have a number of collections in the garden. Uh, we're evaluating them for horticultural traits and we're actually working on propagation both vegetatively and through seed to try and get some nursery folks interested in growing this. So this is again a 20 to 25 year process from inception through uh, propagation and seed production. So it's been uh, you know, another good example of how um, you know, botanic gardens can function. So um, again, talking about insect and disease resistance, you probably all know about the emerald ash borer. I'm not sure how close it is. Uh, it's very close to um, Tompkins County. So um, it's an insect introduced from Northern China into Detroit. Uh, it kills ashes, all, it seems to be all native ashes by creating these galleries in the cambium. Uh, so it started out in the Detroit, uh, Windsor, Canada area and has spread very quickly, uh, and I'll go through these slides quickly, uh, in the last 12 years uh, or so um, across the Northeastern United States um, and just keeps spreading. You know, it's finally reached Philadelphia about three or four years ago. Um, and you can see it it's, doesn't seem to have any um, boundaries or any limits so far. Um, and then the most recent, um, most recent map is September 2007, and you can see it's kind of encircling, uh, it seems to be going down the Erie Canal, uh, or Highway 80, no, not 80, um, 90, 90 um, and then you know, inching its way up from uh, Connecticut as well. So, um, as I said, it affects uh, all native ashes, American ash, which is, you know, has a wide native range and you know, wide, widely planted horticulturally. Green ash, uh, uh, Praxinus, um, uh, Pennsylvania uh, has an even wider native range and if you live in the Dakotas or in Montana it's one of your primary street trees even if you live in Chicago or Detroit uh, so huge economic uh, and uh, biological impact and so um, you know this is sort of the scene you might see in Michigan um, this is my wife's cousin's cottage in Michigan so uh, it affects everybody where it's really having a big impact it's you know everybody knows about this not just horticulturists um, and these are slides from Dan Herms at Ohio State in, um, uh, this is taken in uh, Toledo, Ohio, sort of a before and after shot. So there are huge you know, imp implications for this in many, many ways. Stormwater runoff, heating and cooling costs, removal costs, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, and then you know, there are many nurseries that basically had to tear out their, um, uh, their nursery stock. This is Hinsdale Nursery, a big nursery outside of Chicago destroying all their ashes about 10 years ago. Um, so with this in mind, starting around 2008, we decided to um, go to China and collect uh, a diversity of ash species. There's very little uh, Asian ash in the United States. So the idea was to collect, uh, you know, expand the number of species, get them in the hands of people who are doing research on this and look for any inherent uh, resistance and any potential for breeding work. So, um, we realized quickly that there are no ash experts and we became the ash experts sort of on the fly when we were there. Um, 
And so we collected, uh, starting in 2008 and going up until the last couple of years, a number of different species, and I'll just touch on a couple of these. Fractionus manchurica, which is essentially the green ash of uh, China, uh, gets to be a, a large tree. It's a timber tree there. Um, there may be some resistance here. Um, so here we are collecting those. Uh, Fractionus insularis is a medium-sized tree, uh, previously not known in the United States. It grows along um, stream beds, so perhaps might be a good uh, urban tree. Uh, and it doesn't get too big, so it, this, you know, this has some potential as a, a urban tree. Um, here it is growing. The green tree on the left is Fraxinus insularis. Um, and then uh, another tree, Fraxinus chinensis, which is sort of a smallish tree. Uh, but again, this chinensis has a very uh, similar range to the emerald ash borer. So if there is any inherent resistance, uh, Fraxinus chinensis might have it. Um, so here we are collecting some along the roadside. Um, so those we're growing on at the Arboretum, we've gotten them into hands of researchers uh, uh, in Ohio and in Michigan who are doing work on this. And, and this is really a way we can serve as a conduit uh, to get uh, material into the USDA and into the Forest Service system. Um, so um, what time, One ten. Ten minutes, okay. Uh, I just wanna talk a little bit about traveling in China because it's, you know, it's part of the whole experience and it's sort of a immersion in economic botany in and of itself. So, um, you know, this is still, you know, sort of what you see when you're there, uh, you know, a day in the life of traveling in China. Um, you know, we might, you know, come across roads like this or, um, you know, something like this uh, on the highway. So I've never been more terrified than driving in China. Um, I try not to tell my wife or show my wife uh, some of these slides. Um, uh, you know, so you just sort of look out the window and hold your breath um, when you're in these situations. You see all kinds of crazy things when you're uh, driving around. I'm not really sure whose idea this was. Um, so uh, you get out and fix the road while you're there. Um, and then, as I said, you know, you sort of encounter this, uh, you're immersed in a, a world of economic botany. So this woman is drying uh, a, a Pinus armandii cones, which is a used as a pine nut and widely used uh, as a, a nut, like um, Pinus edulis or the other pine nuts. Um, and then there was a woman cracking these and boiling these, sort of like buying boiled peanuts in the South. You buy boiled pine nuts uh, as you're traveling through, this was outside of Xi'an. Um, and then another roadside stop, as I said, was just sort of this wonderful example of um, economic botany in central Near Xi'an, there's a lot of kiwi production. So kiwi is really the Chinese gooseberry. It's not, you know, the New Zealanders started to grow it and call it kiwi, but it's really native to China. So most of the world's production for juice comes from this part of China. So here's locally grown uh, kiwis, um, plums, apples, um, two kinds of walnuts, the English walnut and, and Chinese walnut on the left, chestnuts. So it's just sort of a whole bounty of locally grown things growing by the side of the road. Um, and then just sort of experiencing, you know, the different architecture and different uh, aspects of culture is pretty remarkable. Um, there's still a lot of coal being burned, so um, I won't make any political comments about that, but um, uh, you still see coal uh, everywhere. Uh, this is our hotel, which sort of mimicked the local, um, uh, you know, local architecture. And then even being in cities is pretty fascinating to see the markets and just see what's going on. Um, in the cities uh, and what goes on on the street is, uh, I think because of uh, a lot of homes in China are small, there's a very vibrant street life, which is really um, pretty fascinating. Uh, here's, you can have your keys made at the local key maker there. Um, you can have your you know, things uh, mended by the local seamstress out on the street um, and so on. Um, one of my favorite shops was uh, the spice shop. This was, um, you basically could pick out your blend of uh, spices for hot pot and they had their sort of house blend and then you could pick out uh, and make your own um, from the various things that are there. Um, and my favorite shop, I love chili peppers. This was the local um, chili pepper um, shop and you can see the grinder in the back. So I don't know what it's like to work here, but um, it certainly was an interesting place to um, visit. And then, uh, you know, wonderful street food as well. Um, this woman has become sort of our unofficial uh, noodle shop in Xi'an. Uh, so with a name like Tony Aiello, I've been eating noodles, you know, pretty much my whole life. Um, these are, you know, 
uh, among the best bowls of noodles um, I've ever had. And so we, every time we're there, we go back, and this is a coal-fired uh, stove. Um, well, scary, but uh, delicious uh, meal. And then uh, it's just really interesting to see uh, hand-pulled noodles as well. And I make my homemade pasta pretty regularly, um, but I don't do this. So uh, uh, this is pretty amazing. Um, but even after a while, you get a little tired of eating noodles, three meals a day. So um, this is what happens after a couple of weeks. Um, so, uh, <laughs> so uh, I'm going to skip a couple, skip ahead for one second to skip through these because I want to focus on something that we've done in the U.S. So, and I'll wrap up with this. So, um, we have done a fair amount of collecting in the U.S. and in 2012, again, Michael Dosman and I had this idea of collecting live oak, Quercus virginiana, at the northern limit of its range. Because we had, in the whole history of the Morris Arboretum, we've had two plants of live oak in the 1950s, which never made it out of the seedling beds, and the Arnold Arboretum has never had live oak in their collection. So we thought, well, why don't we go to the northern limit of the range, both wild populations and cultivated plants, collect acorns, bring them back, grow them on, and see if, um, see if there's any uh, inherent hardiness among them. Uh, so, um, and with, you know, with climate change, perhaps, you know, this may be a plant of the future, even in Philadelphia. So this slide shows in light green, the native range of uh, live oak. And you can see in far southeastern Virginia, one little uh, bright green county. Uh, so it does get up into southeastern Virginia and actually crosses over into the Delmarva Peninsula. So we made a number of collections, as I said. Here's a, another slide showing its native range. The red dots show it in Virginia. We made collections uh, starting in Richmond uh, and then going down to um, uh, the coast in uh, Virginia Beach. Um, so uh, both Michael and I are northern boys. We didn't really know much about uh, live oak, but we made a, you know, a number of collections. Uh, this is at a, a park in Richmond. There's a tree there in the center, uh, which has been there probably for about 100 years or so. And Richmond may be a tad bit warmer than Philadelphia, um, but pretty comparable. So we thought if this tree has survived for 100 years in this park, then you know, maybe there's something to it. Um, we also collected at, at Williamsburg, uh, some trees there. And then again, as I said, in um, Virginia Beach. So again, you know, we're taking notes, you know, even though we're in cultivated areas, we're you know, taking notes and, and keeping track of what we were collecting using the same processes, again, as I said, going down uh, here, collecting um, at William and Mary and then in Colonial Williamsburg itself. We think these trees were um, collected locally and planted there, and they, they've been there, uh, again, going on 100 years. It's probably a little bit, well, it's definitely warmer there than even in Philadelphia, but again, just sort of testing um, so that provenance. And then finally ending at the, uh, one of the northernmost populations in Virginia Beach, um, here, uh, Virginia, this is a place called First Landing State Park, a fascinating state park. It goes from the coast, uh, dunal uh, ecology on the coast, to a bald cypress swamp. Uh, there are seven ecotypes in this one state park, a really fascinating place. Um, it's also the northernmost population of Tillandsia, uh, um, Spanish moss. Yeah, we didn't collect that, but um, uh, we were tempted to do that. Uh, and then here you can see Michael on the right is a uh, live oak growing on the beach, the darker green. And then in the sort of middle to his left is uh, Quercus incana, another oak uh, growing on the dunes. Um, so a very, obviously a very drought tolerant species. And here's some very old live oaks. We don't know how old these are, but they're um, stoloniferous. So these, this organism, this plant is you know, probably 150 years old, if not older. Um, so we came, brought them back, same kind of process. We've had really good germination of them um, and lots of plants. We overwintered them in a somewhat heated greenhouse and an unheated poly house to see if there's any effects. And then just last fall, you can see some you know, in the spring, some leaf damage even at 34 degrees. So we threw those plants out. Um, and then uh, here they are again, a winter in the poly house. Again, some damage, and so those plants get tossed. Um, planted them out this past fall. So they've had one not very cold winter in Philadelphia out in the field. Um, and they, they all survived, and so we're waiting to see what happens over the next couple of winters. So we're kind of in the um, early stages of evaluations of these. But um, 
perhaps in 50 years, live oaks will line the entrance to the Morris Arboretum instead of magnolias. But we'll just have to wait and see. So with that, um, happy to take any questions in the couple of minutes that we have left. Oh, sure. Uh, any questions from Geneva? Were those purple plums in the market Europeans or diploids? Uh, I don't know. Um, yeah, of course, from Geneva. I, I should have known. Uh, I don't know. Um, they look more like Europeans. They could have been, yeah. Because um, they seem pretty large and they seem like what we, what I think of as a plum that we, we get here. So I don't think they were any sort of you know land race or anything really unusual. Thank you. Yes. Did you find any resistance to the hemlock in those hemlocks that you brought back from China? Yeah, so Chinese hemlock seems to have great resistance. I don't want to say total resistance, but seems to have great resistance to hemlock woolly adelgid. It does get some uh, of the uh, Fiorinia scale, uh, but not not on the same level as, um, as our native hemlocks. So, um, so, and, you know, so we've been evaluating it for 25 years, you know, actively and really have not seen any, any impact. And there was some work done um, uh, by a graduate student at um, Yale looking at this. And, and as I said, the, the woolly adelgid that we have is Japanese and affects Japanese species. Um, there are woolly adelgids in China that affect the Chinese species, but those haven't been important to the U.S. John? To follow up on Sonia's question, <laughs> sorry, what is the potential value of introducing a Chinese hemlock or a Chinese ash or its cultivars into the U.S. in terms of our native forest ecology? Right. I think that's a that's an interesting and you know pretty complex question. So I, I think, you know, from a horticultural point of view, I think there's great potential. Um, and that's, you know, I think that's pretty obvious. I, I think it gets a lot muddier and difficult, more difficult to sort of tease out when you think about, um, you know, whether or not you should use these for naturalization or for, you know, reforestation in natural areas. And it's sort of the question with the, with the American chestnut, even though it's, 15, you know, 15 16 or 31 30 seconds American chestnut, is that truly an American chestnut or not? And so I think, I think it, um, my approach has really been more from a horticultural point of view. And I think when you get into kind of uh, restoration work, it gets a little, it gets a lot more complex. Yeah, so I don't have a good answer to that. Other questions? Any of the grad students have a question? Yes. Um, when evaluating invasiveness, do you look at like uh, the roots influences on the carbon nitrogen uh, dynamics or like soil pH, or do you look more at um, compatibility and uh, the speed of the seedling growth? So probably more at the seedling growth. So, so the question is, uh, what do we evaluate when we look at invasive potential invasiveness? So the first thing we look at is how it how it behaves in. China or in the wild, wherever we are. Um, so, uh, and then we look at how well it germinates in the greenhouse. And if it germinates really, really well, we're excited by that because, you know, it's great to have a lot of seedlings, but that, you know, is also a um, kind of a warning sign at the same time. And then um, if you know, sort of it gets through those um, filters, so to speak, uh, we you know we'll plant them out in the garden and watch them. And, and gardeners hate to pull weeds, right? So gardeners don't like weeds. So if something starts to seed in, the gardeners at the arboretum or you know wherever they are, are the first sort of line of people who tell us about that. So there've been you know a few cases where we've actively had things in the garden that we've eliminated. So it's really through more through the life cycle as much as anything. Um, so we had collected uh, in 2015, there was a hydrangea aspera that we we're very excited to collect in Sichuan. Uh, we brought it back and had, you know, incredible seed germination, which was very exciting. I happened to be in China again last year in 2016 and saw this hydrangea everywhere on roadsides everywhere. So that's the kind of thing that makes you think, well, okay, it, it's everywhere. So it seems very adaptable. It germinates very readily. 
Uh, so maybe we really need to keep an eye on something like that. Nina? So the, is the a problem getting like Chinensis in a sleep Chinensis into the nursery tray? Because I've been talking about it with nursery folks and no one's picking it up. Yeah, it's, so yep. The, so the question is, you know, uh, getting, you know, challenges to getting uh, the nursery tray to grow Suga chinensis. And, and I've had the same um, experience in, um, and it's funny, we sent uh, cuttings to a nursery on the West Coast um, who was able to grow them, root them and grow them really well, you know, sort of, you know, the climate out there is so much better and produce these, these great plants. Um, so he, he sent us sort of his dregs um, of this and he had I forget how many you know a couple hundred plants from what the cuttings we sent him uh, and he didn't know what to do with them because they he, you know on the west coast they don't know anything about hemlock woolly adelgid so he was essentially going to trash these really nice Chinese hemlocks so I told him don't do that you know hold on to them and I'll find uh, some nurseries on the east coast that'll buy them from you so I think you know it's it's one of those challenges that are really hard to overcome, and I'm not sure what it is because I think there there is a market out there. I think a, if a couple of people start doing it, maybe it will catch on. Yeah, I've spoken to folks who say, "Where's a source that I get them?" No. Right, there are some seed sources that you can find, uh, and they germinate easily from seed. So um, you know, I can, we can talk about that. Who who has seed? And I I can always always happy to send cuttings to people too. So. Well, with that, I want to thank Tony for an absolutely fantastic. Thank you. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.